Okay, so uh, from the introduction, it sounds like everyone has some experience of with uh, microbiome managed genomic analysis. So this lecture might sound a bit like preaching to the choir. So I thought what I'll do is I'll go over it fairly quickly, but we'll use this opportunity sort of as a discussion. So if there are any points that uh, that you want us to go more in depth or that you want to bring up your perspective, uh, please feel free to, to speak up. And uh, also I want to say this, these lecture the slides were mostly adapted from Rob Biko's uh, previous lecture. I think one year he couldn't make it, so I took over the slides and I got stuck with with them. But it begs the question, why isn't Rob giving this lecture today? So I'll do my best. <laughs> okay, so uh, as you know, you're here for three day uh, intensive workshop in meta, uh, microbiome analysis. So uh, we broke the uh, uh, like the, the workshop into eight different modules, and I'll briefly go over them. So the first module is is this one right here. So we'll introduce the basic concept, the definitions, the general approach, and some of the resources available. Uh, in module two. Uh, we'll go into uh, marker gene analysis, mainly based on 16S analysis, and uh, use that to demonstrate how you can measure community diversity or sample diversity. Uh, in other words, uh, well, sample diversity, alpha, diver alpha diversity, and beta diversity uh, for uh, the different uh, samples and, and communities. Um, and for module three, We'll, you, we'll go into PyCross, which is a tool that Morgan developed to link between uh, marker-based uh, analysis, in, in other words, taxonomic markers, two functional, mar uh, two functional genes and, and infer functions from uh, marker genes. Uh, in module four, uh, then we'll go, to, go into uh, shotgun metagenomic analysis, talking both about the taxonomic uh, uh, classification and functional classification of the, the uh, samples that you get from metagenomic shotgun sequencing. This used to be two separate lectures, but we can do two separate modules, but we condense it into one module uh, to make room for additional topics. But also, as the tools have improved over the last few years, it also streamlined the, the process uh, quite a bit. And module five. It, is new, and Laura will be talking about how you can take uh, metagenomic samples and assemble them. Uh, sometimes you have to pre-bin the, the metagenomic reads before you can assemble it. And how do you attract? How do you uh, extract genomic sequences? Uh, sometimes full genomes from metagenomic data. Um, module six would be from would be uh, would be on metatranscriptomics and. John will, will be covering how you can uh, do um, RNA-seq analysis. Okay. Um, module 7 is also new, and uh, Rob will be covering Module 7, give you some more advanced uh, statistical analysis that you can apply to, uh, I think, mainly on marker gene data. But are you going to cover any uh, shotgun data as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of the uh, methods kind of work. Uh, Right. Yeah, so uh, you'll, so you'll be an extension on uh, module two and module four to give you some more um, background information on uh, statistical analysis of the data sets that we'll see in this workshop. And module eight would be a, a lecture delivered by uh, Fiona on, you know, once you carried out the, the sequence analysis, once you've done your, your statistical, statistical analysis uh, doing the abundance, uh, analysis uh, differentiating the um, the different microbiome samples. How can you use the the results to select for biomarkers that can be associated with with different conditions, such as diseases or different environmental conditions? Any questions so far? Anything that we missed or that you think we sh we should have covered? Um, 
so the general learning objective for this entire workshop is to be able to define the different types of metagenomic projects uh, and process the data. So there will be a lot of opportunities for hands-on uh, usage of the, the different tools. And uh, you, we'll show you how you can run some standard pipelines for marker genes for metagenomics and metatranscriptomic data sets. And, uh, we'll also be making these tools available to you so you can uh, replicate the analysis when you go home with your own data set. And if you want to, you can also have opportunity to, to try out your own data set during this workshop if you're more, more advanced. Um, and uh, also important throughout the, the lecture, uh, throughout the workshop, we will bring up some technical and sometimes philosophical limitations of the metagenomic studies so you're aware uh, on some of the the important uh, limitations, and not make um, predictions or make estimations uh, overestimate the power of, of metagenomic studies. So for this specific module, you will apply key ter uh, terms in metagenomics. For example, uh, you will understand what uh, microbial communities. So how many People have heard, heard of the have, have uh, been exposed to the OTU versus ASV kind of debate. Uh, how many have you heard of OTU? Almost everyone. How many have heard ASV or ESV or Ampicon, um sequence variant? Much fewer people. Okay. So I guess this is routine to to bring up that, that particular discussion. Uh, in the in the next session, so uh, we'll also uh, show you a few types of uh, main objective for why we carry out metagenomic studies, and uh, in, in more more in module two, we'll interpret the content of, of sequence data, and uh, lastly, I'll cover some of the common resources for reference databases and so on. So the term microbiome uh, has been attributed to Joshua Lilliber and by uh, Laura Hooper and, and Jeffrey Gordon. Uh, uh, so he defined the microbiome as collective genome of our indigenous micro microbes, which used to be called microflora. But as you should all know, that bacteria and, and archaea are not plants, so the term microflora has been uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of fell out of favor, so it's not really been, been commonly used except in, uh, in the, not, not in the microbiome community anyway. So the idea being that the comprehensive, it takes a comprehensive genetic view of the, um, the human as a life form and it's uh, Micro, and, and its microbiome, so to, to sort of take a holistic view of of human as a as, as an ecosystem. So the term microbiota is the actual set of microorganisms that are found in a particular setting. So uh, there's a bit of a historical confusion about microbiome and microbiota because some people assume microbiome men uh, in, they interpret it as the uh, the microbial biome, so they use it to refer to the uh, the organisms. But in in our case, uh, we sort of make differentiation. But ultimately, sometimes the, the term are interchangeable. Uh, metagenomics, on the other hand, is quite different from the term microbiome or microbiota. Uh, and Joe Handelsman in '98 actually used it to de describe functional. Uh, functional aspect of the the microbiome, so it's and, and she was more referring to meta as in in uh, beyond, so defined it as the advance of molecular biology and uh, and eukaryotic genomics, which have laid the groundwork for cloning and functional analysis of collected genomes. Again, so a community based approach of soil microflora, and um, she turned that the meta genome of of the soil. So we sort of make the distinction that metagenomics refer more to the functional aspect uh, and, and take a shotgun approach to identify the functional genes, 
rather than the, the marker gene based approach, which um, typically don't give you a uh, functional aspect of the community, but gives you sort of a taxonomic aspect of the community. So the the goal of the uh, microbiome studies is to explore the relationships of the microbes and their habitat, including uh, human and, and its effect on our health. So to accomplish this, we use different molecular biology techniques and computational techniques to uh, make inference about the community. So in this workshop, we'll be talking about how you use marker genes to characterize a community. How do you then um, take the, uh, use PyCRAS to, to go from marker genes to function? But then we'll also we'll show you how you can do metagenomics analysis using uh, shotgun metagenomics data. And then uh, we'll, talk, we'll also talk about uh, RNA-seq data sets using Managen, for, for metagenomics. Um, we will not be covering metaproteomics uh, and, uh, and metabolic type of, uh, so not, not proteomics or, or metabolic type of studies in, in this workshop. Um, but the point here is that there are many terms now ending with omics or ohms to refer to sort of a, a community or a, a based uh, or a systems-based approach to understand uh, a, a community holistically. So there's also culturum, which talks about how you will culture different organisms uh, and, and so on. So. so why do we take a metagenomics approach? Uh, so as you know, most organisms don't live in isolation. They live in a community. So a, a traditional cultural-based approach where you try to isolate a single organism, uh, and which is still the dominant practice in diagnostic labs and, and many other uh, medical microbiology labs, is still very much a, 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 um, a clonal view of, of uh, or pure culture view of uh, to uh, pathogenesis to, to diseases, right? so, and but it often missed the, the in, intricacy, uh, the interactions between uh, different organisms living in the same community. Um, and a while back, there's a uh, paper published about the great plate count, normally sort of comparing the number of organisms that can be successfully cultivated on the plate versus what's observed uh, under a microscope or under a, uh, or, or observed uh, molecularly. So, it, so and um, I estimate that less than 1% of the organisms across habitat can be cultivated. And this, uh, of course, now it's a bit controversial because people have been systematically trying to cultivate organisms, especially ones found in, in environments that we care about, such as the human gut or uh, other parts of human body, and then the uh, percentage of organisms that can be cultured it can actually be higher. And more importantly, um, the um, the ones that if you can culture them in a bioreactor or some way of allowing them to interact with each other, it greatly increase the the um, the culturable organisms uh, that you can grow in the in the lab. So. Uh, but in any event, it's, it's not possible to culture all organisms, uh, at, at least at the present time. So to, to take an alternative approach where you can interrogate the community without culturing them is uh, why microbiome and metagenomics analysis uh, uh, became so popular. And as of last year, I last checked, there's about 25,000 papers, and I'm sure some of you have contributed to, to that count uh, of number of microbiome papers published in, in the last 10 years. So when I was preparing the lecture for, for some, other, like, uh, some other course, it was, it was during Thanksgiving, so I was looking around for examples. And I found this one, which is still appropriate, I think, given this context. Um, so, but anyway, like the the there's microbiomes of, of of many different things, and I think throughout this lectures, uh, throughout this workshop, you'll hear a lot 
more about other studies. Um, but I want to highlight this one uh, because it's, it's a good example where, you know, a microbiome of a, a food product or, or organism, uh, 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 a food, uh, uh, yeah, I guess a food product or a, a, a bird can actually be intricately linked to hu human health. So we care about the turkey microbiome because um, the, as we know, gut microbiome can drive metabolism and prime host immune system. And the, the, the studies have shown that wild turkey and domestic turkeys actually have very different gut microbiome due to the in, uh, interference that uh, in, in the agricultural process. And moreover, many of the organisms are unknown and unculturable, yet we apply uh, low dosage of antibiotics as a, as a growth promoter. In, in, they're still in practice in certain se settings, even though it's, we believe not, uh, well, it's not allowed in the EU, and I'm pretty sure it's not allowed in Canada, but people from CFIA can probably let me know if that's the case or not. Uh, but antibiotics, as we'll see in, in module two, can actually, in the lab session, can actually affect the, uh, the diversity of the, the native microbiome and uh, give uh, um, pathogens an opportunity to to thrive in an environment that they otherwise would be outcompete. Right. So the opportunities path pathogens uh, due to the intervention of of and and uh, antibiotics as growth promoters can actually affect our food safety and um, the. Uh, study of the gut microbiome may actually, of, of turkey, may actually lead to better ways of enhancing the growth without the use of antibiotics. Uh, yeah, so, and like just by searching for turkey or tur uh, turkey, I also came across a drink, uh, sorry, a study that looks at different Turkish fer fermented drinks. So. Uh, it's not surprising a lot of uh, lactic acid bacteria that are found in these fermented drinks. Um, and the, the uh, I was in the Oxford Nanopore. How many people have heard of uh, Minayang or, or Oxford Nanopore? Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, a small device for, for sequencing. Right? So um, I was at a, a through a one-day workshop, and the workshop actually went to, the, the instructors went to a store and bought some kefir and, and extracted DNA from kefir and sequenced in the workshop. And uh, so these type of study that I think was published in 2013 took, you know, months, if not years to, uh, maybe not years, months to, to prepare, can now be done using the current sequencing technology in a single day as a demonstration in the workshop to show you what kind of um, organism, what kind of microbes can be found in your kefir uh, or in your kombucha. That was the other uh, type of drinks that was used to, to extract uh, DNA for sequencing in that workshop. Um, and so it really brings home the, the idea that we can we now have the, the tools and the both sequencing tools and as we will learn in this workshop, the bioinformatic tools to really study what type of organisms are in our surrounding, are in our food, in our and in our in and on our body. And um, most of you probably have heard that most uh, this phrase "most of you" is not you. Uh, stem from the observation that most of the cells found on your body actually uh, are non-human cells, and the um, ratio is approximately sort of two to one, uh, believe in the sort of latest latest estimation, and uh, the like the microbes in and on your body encode five hundred times more genes than the human genes. And it weighs about two kilo of your body weight. Um, so, how many human genes do we uh, do we have approximately? 
twenty thousand. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's about right. So, so imagine you have about twenty thousand or twenty-five thousand genes. Um, the number of of uh, um, microbial genes is, is rain, uh, sort of collectively is about two to three million different types of genes in and on you. Okay, so I was uh, referring to the different sequencing technology available um, that have vastly speed up our uh, ability to, to generate sequence data and therefore use a, a sequencing-based approach or molecular approach to interrogate the microbiome. Um, so most of the, uh, so Roche 454 is actually, it, Rarely in use these days as sort of a discontinued product that uh, uh, been support meant with minimum support, and Sanger, of course, is the the traditional sequencing uh, platform. The most sort of dominant short read sequencing platform, as uh, may know, is the the Illumina series of sequencers, ranging from desktop um, MySeq all the way to large scale uh, sequencers, uh, such as different versions of the HiSeq. And more recently, the so-called third generation with single molecular sequencing had been um, sort of <coughs> had been, <coughs> sorry had been made available uh, publicly, and the two uh, dominant ones are the Pac Pacific uh, Bioscience or Pac Bio platforms, which. Uh, Occupy an entire room and, and requires um, reinforced concrete floor. This, this thing, I think, weighs at about a ton or so, uh, compared to the Oxford Nanopore device, which is, uh, as you can see, the scale here, um, sort of a thumb drive size device, and you just plug it into your USB uh, port on your laptop to to uh, to generate sequence data. So the different devices has drastically increased uh, uh, our uh, sequencing capacity in the last few years. Okay, any questions so far or any observation so far? So how many people are using um, Illumina sequencers for their, to generate their data? Almost everyone, okay, anyone using uh, Oxford Nanopore, Minaya. Okay, few. Okay, so yeah, if you might want to, if you're interested, you may want to talk to each other to to share your experience in, in these platforms, uh, especially the the new the, the newer Minaya platform. How it how uh, how it goes when it when you generate your um, when you try to run a, a metagenomic samples or even a, a marker. Uh, Gene sa uh, sample on, on these, uh, empicon samples on these, uh, on these devices. Okay. So, so, um, so, what can we answer with microbiome studies? Um, roughly speaking, there's four four different uh, general questions. Uh, first is just who's there and what's in the microbiome, and this can typically be achieved. Uh, using a, a marker gene based uh, study and uh, but of course you can also do metagenomic shotgun sequencing and and infer uh, taxonomic information from this the shotgun data and we'll talk a little bit about that in module four okay uh, so the other um, general question is what are the functions that are present in these microbiomes, and the uh, the study here is uh, drawn from an ongoing study in, in Rob's group, looking at the di the different um, antimicrobial resistant genes in, in an elderly population, and I th so I'll let you add any comments. But he was pointing out essentially that the diff so. Along the, the x-axis are the different classes of antibiotic uh, resistant genes and, and the, their sort of, um, uh, their proportions in, in, the, in the samples. And so the different um, 
types of, of uh, resistant genes are present at a different level, but also, uh, as you can see in the sort of the, the height of the, the uncertainty or the, the error bars, it shows the, the, vari um, the variations across the, across the subjects. So some genes are present in low abundance and highly variable uh, across different subjects. So the, their micro, I mean, of course, their microbiome encode these, these genes. And some of the um, other genes are, seem to be found in all subjects in high abundance, such as beta lactamase resistant genes. And some are sort of in between that everyone has this particular gene, but they seem to be, um, be uh, everyone consistently have this gene, and, and there's uh, low variations across different subjects. Anything you want to add? Just one quick thing. Uh, if you've never heard of alpamycin, it's no surprise because it's not actually used. And this is a nice illustration of the joys of functional annotation of that genome. That's not alpamycin resistance. It's a very, very similar uh, protein sequence with a completely different function. So it's a cautionary tale. All right, so the next question is um, asking what do the functions or the uh, taxonomic profile of the microbiome uh, correlate with? And this is looking at uh, the different characteristics of your samples or of, of, the, of uh, the conditions that you want to study and uh, correlating uh, your microbiome with those uh, indicators. And this is the, um, the topic of, of our statistical analysis module and, uh, and also it will be brought up in, in some of the other modules as well. So uh, in this particular study, for example, this, this um, uh, it looked at the, the correlation between the soil microbiome uh, in terms of its diversity versus the, the uh, pH level in the soil. And you can see there's a nonlinear relationship uh, between the, the two indicators, uh, between the two variables, I mean. And another study and looking at the frequency of uh, saliva, uh, that sort of the saliva, correlating the saliva microbiome similarity to the, the kissing frequency of, of uh, presumably couples, but who knows. Okay, so um, more, so not just finding the, the relationship between um, uh, microbes and its, in, and its environment, it's also uh, possible to to use time series to look at the, how microbiomes will respond over time to, to different treatments. So this is a, a study um, looking at uh, essentially uh, in a mouse model looking at a C. diff infection. So mice that are treated with, uh, sorry, mice that, are, um, that have, uh, uh, that are healthy and, and um, not being infected by uh, C. diff are in, in this quadrant here. And we'll talk about the, this type of display, which is called a, a principal component analysis, essentially projecting uh, high dimensional data in, in a two dimensional structure. So you're looking at the uh, maximum separation between different groups of organisms. So in this corner here, uh, the, these are the healthy individuals. And uh, what and these group here are the um, um, organisms have been treated with with antibiotics. And what's interesting is that this is the the, um, the group that are persistently um, uh, shedding uh, C diff and have si a clinical signs of infection. The, this this sort of sick group, and uh, the uh, researchers then. Uh, um, introduced the, uh, micro, uh, the fecal samples from the healthy uh, mice into 
these uh, C. diff infected mice. And over time, as you can see, the, the small number here indicated the number of uh, uh, the, the, the time, um, time points in the study. You can see that over time, the, uh, the number increased the um, C. diff uh, infected organisms, uh, the infected mice gradually might uh, become more and more similar to the, to the healthy ones. So uh, by day 14, it has the similar um, microbiome profile as the healthy individuals, showing that the fecal transplant uh, was able to um, improve the, the uh, health, and they no longer look like the uh, persistent sh uh, shatters. OK, so as I mentioned in the introduction, sort of want to give a bit of historic perspective of how uh, metagenomic studies uh, came about. And it really started uh, with the, the, different, the development of different sequencing technologies and allowing us to look at DNA uh, or the genetic material as a proxy to uh, phenotypic uh, studies of these uh, organisms. Uh, so in the 70s, um, the Sanger sequencing technology was developed along with some other alternative sequencing technologies. And, and shortly after that, um, um, it was applied to, to, um, to different communities to identify um, to, and, in, and use it as a marker gene to identify the uh, different organisms in in the community and and towards the end of 1970s one of the first so at that time it's not called bioinformatic but one of the sequence and analysis tools called uh, tool kit was or package was developed called statin and, and um, people are quite optimistic uh, with the, the the technology development and uh, the um, uh, statin who developed the, the package uh, had this uh, observation that DNA sequencing is now a fast procedure, and the availability of computers uh, gives the possibility of more efficient overall strategy for, for sequence determination. And of course, uh, compared to what we can do nowadays, this is considered a, a, a low throughput technology. Yet, I'm just encouraging you to think you know, 5, 10 years, or maybe 20 years from now, that it was technology improvements, we will be looking back at our current technical challenges and think, um, you know, we have achieved a lot, but but the field, the, te the technology is, is moving uh, faster. So problems that you might not be able to solve today may have a better solution tomorrow. So don't, don't get discouraged and, and focus on what you can solve and what you can accurately in interpret um, with the, with the current technology limitation, namely the short reads, the inaccuracy of reads, and so on. OK, so, uh, so on. And, and by 80s, as I mentioned, uh, uh, that they've been looking at the different communities and, and, uh, and finding marker genes uh, as a way to characterize those communities. And this is primarily an effort out of Norman Pace's group uh, where he uh, his group looked at the uh, a different low complex uh, communities and was able to uh, extract enough DNAs, uh, clone them, and, and sequence them, and uh, you see sequences like this and um, comparing uh, an, a known sequence that's in the database with a given name to an unknown sequence, a query sequence that, that's in your sample. And through these type of similarity search comparison, you can then infer what's uh, found in the community of interest. By the 90s, uh, Sanger sequencing had been improved. So now you have capillary sequencing. And um, you're able to do 96 or 384 sequences in a single run. Um, so the uh, development uh, led to, uh, for example, this, the, um, the, the different, uh, different studies to look 
at uh, using 16S as, as a marker to look at uh, different uh, communities. It's also the, the era of um, whole genome sequencing. You have enough throughput now instead of sequencing marker, single marker genes can take a shotgun sequence approach and, and assemble the entire genome. So in 1995, that's when the first bacterial genome was uh, sequenced, assembled, and, and published. In metagenomics, as a term that was defined in, around at the end of the 90s. And this is also where Illumina uh, was founded. So in 2000s, uh, this is arguably sort of the, the early ages of, of um, microbiome studies. People are applying early uh, next-gen sequencing and also Sanger sequencing to, uh, to different communities. So um, some of the sort of very well-known ones is their Sargasso Sea uh, expedition led by Craig Venter essentially go around the uh, believe the Gulf Coast at that time and, and uh, extract DNAs from seawaters and, and sequence uh, to identify what kind of um, bacteria and archaea are found in, in the in the in the seawater. And uh, the acid uh, the acid mite drainage is another interesting study that look at a low complexity um, in, uh, community and was and this is one of the I think this is the f one of the first paper, if not the first paper, that's shown you can actually assemble a complete genome from uh, a my from metagenomics data if the uh, the um, community complexity is is low enough. And and with with um, sequencing becoming increasingly cheap, uh, increasingly. Um, less expensive. Um, there are uh, uh, sort of commercial offerings and even citizen scientists um, sort of nonprofit offerings to let you sequence, you know, your own uh, gut or to sequence um, your cats uh, or to sequence your dogs. And or even uh, there's something called a second uh, genome project that look at your um, microbial community, and for a low fee, you can actually pay these companies to, to sequence your own microbiome. Okay, so for the last bit, I'll move into uh, some of the major concerns with metagenomic analysis. So, <coughs> off the top of the list is is data quality issue, as I alluded to. So, sequencing is is not error free, and depending on the sequencing platform. You can have uh, very accurate sequences, such as the one generated on Illumina, uh, with less than 0.1% error rate due to substitution. Um, uh, as a side note here, Illumina reads the quality drops as, as the read gets longer. So towards the end of your read, the substitution, uh, the, the error rate is is, def is significantly over 0.1%. Uh, uh, so this is sort of the average of, of uh, uh, average error rate uh, across sequences. Um, the, the single molecular sequencing platforms such as PacBio and MinIons, however, has much significantly uh, higher error rate, ranging from 10% to 15%. So imagine one out of 10 uh, base in your sequence uh, uh, is, is uh, incorrect. And in those cases, um, you need to be able to is needs need to learn how to interpret those those results and how to correct for the errors. Um, so for amplicon studies, chimeras uh, it can be an issue. There's about one percent uh, chance of getting a chimeric read, and this is when doing PCR reaction uh, two or more t templates were were combined artificially into a single uh, amplicon and. Um, there are tools that will help you detect uh, chimeric reads. The other uh, data quality is not issue is associated with the, the metadata or 
uh, contextual information about the sequence data that you're generating. And how many of you have gone into a public database trying to find a similar study to yours or the ones that you're interested in or read a paper and say, okay, this looks like an interesting data set. I want to download it and try it. And when you go to the, uh, say, NCBI, you realize that the metadata found in the paper and the metadata found in the public archive are essentially not mat matching. So you either have to contact the authors or just gave up on that data set. So how many of you have, have tried that and and failed? So, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So, so we just want to highlight the importance of, of metadata. They, they don't fear that people might, might scoop your work or, or scoop your data. I think there's enough, you know, samples out there for everyone to, to sample. They, it's important to be able to to reuse the data that that are being generated to help in your own study or your own interpretation. So think that way, and and when you deposit your own data into the, the public repositories, make sure it's easy to for other people to to reuse. Okay, and there are community standards that can help you uh, in, uh, make. The metadata more consistent. Um, I won't go into the details here, but roughly speaking, it consists of a, a minimum checklist uh, asking you to specify some key information about your your study. Um, but in addition to that, depending on the environment that you're trying to study, or the um, or the uh, the sample types. Uh, there are also specific environmental packages uh, with additional data fields that would be good to specify so other people can, can reuse your data without having to, to recompile the metadata themselves. Um, so if you go to this website, it will give you an Excel spreadsheet of all the data fields. Uh, what these metadata standards don't uh, really enforce is the values you put into the uh, into the field. So so some fields are easier to enforce, such as day uh, day formats or or uh, specific measurements of, of specific units and so on. But there's are still a lot of free text. So actually, some of the work that I've done in my group is trying to improve uh, the terminologies used in in these. Um, in these metadata standards, to ensure that you describe uh, the same, the, uh, describe things consistently through the use of, of control vocabularies and and uh, what's called ontologies. And so recently, there's a, a paper published by Mark Watkinson and at all called the Fair Principle, and it's actually gaining a lot of of uh, uh, it's getting a lot of notice uh, as, uh, defining how a data set should be um, uh, stored and, and, and curated to ensure that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable by other by others. And uh, more and more um, funding agencies are actually looking at um, this fair principle as, a, as an indicator of, of how uh, they should, uh, uh, that the data generator should behave or should uh, um, should uh, try to achieve with, with their data, um, data sets. Okay, um, so the other uh, key, uh, the, another major concern of, of uh, metagenomic analysis is the comparability or, or reproducibility of, of the data. And as I mentioned already, often the public data sets that you want to use for your own comparison essentially are not usable. Um, and, often, and in many cases, even if you want to reproduce the, the experiment using similar sample types and using similar uh, uh, pr uh, process or similar SOPs, it, it's still difficult to, to reproduce an, ex <coughs> an experiment. And some of the, the factors affecting this is uh, the use of different marker genes or different marker um, regions 
and the, the, this can affect the, uh, the, the results of your, um, of your microbiome study. And the different sequencing platforms and, and sampling conditions can also give different results, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. And lastly, the um, workflows are often uh, ad hoc, so a lot of time the details of a workflow, such as the parameters used and so on, are not uh, kept. So in this workshop, we'll actually show you some of the, for example, how Chime to uh, help um, to publish the, the workflows as well as the results. So uh, you can keep track of the, the analysis you did and, and the data sets you, you use and so on. Okay, so uh, another concern is, is regarding the the, um, the linkage and, and resolution issue. So the the current technology, especially um, uh, marker gene based analysis, only look at a small region of a, a 16S gene. And even if you look at the entire uh, 16S gene, it still doesn't some doesn't have the resolution often to, to differentiate different strains within, within the species. So um, the strain level diversity in metagenomes will often be missed due to the difficulty in either uh, interpreting the 6 S genes or when it comes to shotgun sequencing, uh, the inability to assemble, re, re, reconstitute your genomes at the, um, at the strain level. So, I think Laura would touch on this a bit more um, in her in her lecture. So, um, and we will talk about how um, whether the pros and cons of assemble your metagenomics reads and how to um, uh, interpret the the quality of your uh, assembly. Okay, so another issue is concerning taxonomy and OTUs. So taxonomy is the, the names you give to a, an organism or a group of organisms. And as mentioned already, a lot of the organisms in your samples are unknown. So in other words, it doesn't have a name. So the approach that's taken to, to um, to deal with that is essentially to give them an OTU, Operational Taxonomic Unit, as a placeholder for a, pr a proper name. Um, the uh, issue with OTUs is uh, it's not correlated to the function or to the phenotypes of the organism, and it's often an arbitrary threshold uh, and often set at 97 percent um, sequence, 97 percent sequence similarity as the threshold for grouping organisms. And we'll talk in, in module two uh, why that that's an issue. Um, okay. So last uh, concern is uh, with the functional annotation. Again, um, there's many unknown genes of unknown functions or hypothetical genes in your data set. And some of the studies shown here that on average uh, even um, with uh, some detailed um, annotation in terms of the molecular functions, there's still a large number of of um, of uh, uh, large proportions of genes that have unknown functions. So in in this case, roughly. 60% of, of genes are, are um, have an annotation, but the rest are. Uh, and when it comes to biological processes, the, the proportion is even lower. So when you do a metagenomic study, uh, often you, more often than not, you're do, especially in the environmental samples, more often than not, you're dealing with, with genes that simply don't have uh, equivalent in the database, and therefore you will not be able to uh, use similarity search to identify the function of, of such uh, gene, and you might need to look at uh, correlation of, of that gene to your 
uh, sample um, context in order to try to understand what other possible functions where you might need to do some uh, pathway studies to, to try to infer the functions of, of, of uh, genes of unknown function. Okay, so given the time, I'll go through the resources very quickly. This is really just to highlight some of the common uh, databases that you can use to uh, uh, reference databases that you can use uh, for your analysis. So for 16S, um, the, sort of the, the most common ones are probably uh, right now Silva and Green Gene data sets. These are curated uh, 16S sequences and other marker gene sequences uh, that you can compare your your samples to. Uh, often you might also be interested in uh, whole genomes as reference genomes to then uh, for your metagenomics data set. And again, N uh, so NCBI, GenBank has a list of curated genomes. And over the last few years, the microbiome communities or the uh, have or the, the, the research community have systematically trying to sequence uh, genomes from um, from common metagenomic uh, samples in order to uh, to improve the, the reference data set available in uh, in these genomic databases. Um, and Patrick and um, uh, in addition to, to being a repository, also provide some tools that allow you to, to study genomes. Now, uh, metagenomics, uh, again, there are several repositories. So for the Human Microbiome Project, uh, the data is uh, archived in the, the uh, what's called HMP DAC, uh, so Data Coordination Centers, for uh, the, the Human Microbiome Project. So as a wealth of information ranging from the SOPs to uh, the different data sets available. And you can also request uh, access to certain metadata through, through this portal. Um, EBI has its own metagenomic uh, and NCBI2 metagenomic um, re-archives that you can access. And uh, MGRAS is a, another resource, but one Cautionary note is that MGRAS, the tools provided often overestimate the uh, the pre over predict. So uh, you be careful when you use the, the tools provided within. Um, uh, some for functional studies, I'm just highlighting a few, such as uh, metabolic pathways. You can use Cake to annotate your your own genes. Uh, for some protein families um, analysis, uh, you can go to Unipro for uh, reference uh, protein, so it's for, for protein family references. Um, CARD is a antimicrobial resistant database that Justin here actually has a, was, was uh, helping to, uh, had helped to, to build. And it uh, allow you to, to curate uh, different um, antibody resistant genes that are found in your samples. And as uh, Rob pointed out, you know, it could also have some annotation issues uh, that um, might give you the, the wrong um, prediction. But overall, it's, it's a high-quality, manually curated um, um, data set for antibi and a database for antimicrobial resistance genes. And Gene Ontology provides uh, consistent naming fun uh, schemes for di the different function functional uh, genes, functional proteins. Okay, any questions? If not, we can uh, have coffee or... Mm -hmm.